I called this meeting of the Pearland Independent School District Board of Trustees to order on May 19th at 11.03 a.m. I let the record show that a quorum of board members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. Let the record show that trustees Gooden, Botkin, Decker, and Carbone are present. We'll go directly into our public comment uh, session. We did not have any speakers who signed up to speak. Uh, so we will go directly into our uh, closed session. The Board of Trustees will, of the Pearland Independent School District will now convene into a closed meeting to discuss items uh, posted on our agenda uh, as allowed by Title V, Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code. Uh, the superintendent will present for the board's consideration and discussion of the following matters. Those are sections 071, 072, 074, 075, 076, 082, 083, and 084. All of those are listed on the agenda. I let the record show that Trustee Murphy has joined us. All right, no voting will take place in closed meeting. Any action the board wishes to take as a result of the discussions in closed meeting will take place after the board reconvenes in its open session. It is now 11.04 a.m. and the board will adjourn into closed session. Now this meeting is gonna stay open and the board's gonna, and the exec, and the exec uh, staff is gonna go out, go to the other meeting and then come back here as soon as we're done. All right, we uh, stand adjourned into a closed session. Uh, the board will reconvene in open session at 12 33 p.m. Is there a motion? Yes. Uh, let me see. Uh, yes, I have a motion. Yes. I move we accept and approve the superintendent's recommendation for employment of personnel as presented. Thank you. Yeah. Motion, Decker. Is there a second? Second. Second, Carbone. Any further discussion? All right, we'll go ahead and do the round robin voting as we did last time. Uh, Trustee Botkin, how do you vote? Yay. Good vote to yay. Decker? Yay. Carbone? Yep. Murphy? Yay. One, two, three, four, five. Motion carries five to zero with uh, Trustee Floyd absent and Trustee Barry on his way to the meeting. All right. That will take us to consent agenda. Uh, Ms. President, um, yes. we, we do have a uh, just a. Oh, there's a second thing with, for the uh, principals, assistant principals. Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, I'm not sure if that was a a, a, sec, a different motion, was it? I don't think it was, but I, th I was thinking you wanted to. Oh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. You mentioned the uh, no, but go ahead. Yeah, um, but that's a good point, and I think I think at least one of the two may be with us. Um, I don't know if Rosemary Wall Wallace Vasiliadis is with us. Is she present? Um, but I know that, I think I just saw that uh, our other candidate, um, Janetta Ernest, who will be a new assistant principal for us, that she is present. Congratulations, Janetta. Congratulations. Congratulations. Welcome. Thank you. Congrats. All right. But I uh, know, uh, Charles, my original reason for uh, saying yes. something there was um, Kim has a few uh, announcements with regard to board recognition. Yes, thank you very much. All right, Ms. Ocott? Yes, sir. Let thank me you. share the screen with y'all. Just wanted to say how much I know the board loves having board recognition and um, we certainly are missing having the kids here and having the kids in our hallways and the buildings and here at the board meetings, but we wanted to make sure that we honor them. Uh, certificates have been sent out to them, but wanted to share with the board that we have um, recognized um, kind of virtually about 375 students. First, we have all state choir. We had 14 kids from Dawson and Pearland. We had all state band. We had 11 kids from Dawson and Pearland. For region band, we had 169 kids from all four of our junior highs. So that's fantastic. Um, Region Choir, we had 79 students from the four junior highs. For the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, for uh, artwork, for Best of Show, we had four students, from one from Dawson, Magnolia, Junior High West, and Pearland High School. We also had 
uh, four gold medal artists from Magnolia, Barry Miller, and two from Dawson. We had a special merit artwork. We had nine of those, six from Dawson, two from Pearland, and one from Turner. Um, the communications department also went to our state conference right before COVID-19 hit, and we were awarded 14 state awards for our communications efforts. Our uh, Dawson High School improv troupe made it to uh, the state quarter quarterfinalists. We had 12 students involved in that under the leadership of Mr. Grimmett, our secondary teacher of the year. Um, we had individual awards. One student was named to the all-star improv troupe. And then we had six students named as Texas Thespian Festival National Qualifying Performers. So they'll move on. Our district quiz bowl champions, I know some of you attended that, was Sabalatora Middle School, in case you weren't there. Uh, for HOSA International, we have three students from Turner who qualified for that. And this is, I wanna say, the fifth consecutive year that we have had Turner students competing at the international level. So that is really spectacular. For DECA International, we had seven students, six from Dawson and one from Pearland. And then we had one student who qualified for State VASE, which is the Visual Arts Scholastic event, and they got a gold seal in that from Dawson. And then we also had students who annually enter the Scholastic Art and Writing Contest. We had two national gold winners from Dawson and a national silver winner from Dawson. And then this was kind of a neat thing that happened. Um, we had three students from Turner High School. We sent out to all of our schools and Turner High School, um, the F, uh, FBI, Houston FBI had a think before you post social media contest and they did a PSA, public service announcement. And these students got second place in that contest for the Houston FBI. And then finally, our National Merit Scholarship finalists, we had 17 students from Pearland and Dawson High School. So we're really proud of these kids and you know, we will try to have them in person when we are able to do so. Um, but we certainly have already sent recognition to them and their certificates and you know, very proud of their efforts. Also, uh, Kim, I noticed that John Grimmett is one of the participants in, in our meeting today. And yes. as you mentioned, he is the district teacher of the year at the secondary level our drama uh, teacher over at Dawson High School. Congratulations, John. Yes. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I follow you on Twitter, man. It's really engaging content. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to share those honors of our kids. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And also our financial, uh, our business office received an award for excellence in financial reporting. Uh, and the upteenth year in a row, but uh, congratulations. Thank you guys. Thank you. Okay. All right. Now, to new business, and we'll go to the consent agenda. Just a quick note after the consent agenda, I'm going to move up the reports on the culturally responsive committee and then the district matters associated with COVID 19. Uh, but the consent agenda is presented as items one through 11. Are there any items a trustee would like to pull for further discussion? Mr. President, I'd like to pull A7. Yes, ma'am. And Mr. President, I'd like to put pull item 10. Item 10. Yes, ma'am. And uh, I will pull item four. Just a quick question there. Okay, so we have items four, seven, and 10 pulled. Are there any furthers that want to be pulled? Anything else that wants to be pulled? Okay, uh, is there a motion to uh, adopt the consent agenda items one, two, three, five, six, eight, nine, and 11? So moved. Motion Decker, is there a second? Second. Second, Carbone. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, let's see. Trustee, I'll start with you again, Trustee Bakken. How do you vote? Yay. All right, good and votes, yay. Decker? Yay. Carbone. Aye. Uh, Jeff Barry, did you join the meeting? No? Okay, he's still out. All right, Trustee Murphy. Aye. All right, motion carries 5-0 with uh, Trustees Floyd, Trustee Floyd Absent and Trustee Barry uh, temporarily, I think, out of the meeting. All right, so item four on the agenda was the partial roof replacement. And my question was about uh, the the low bidder did not get that job, and they had a 
uh, where they seem to lose a lot of points there was on the, I guess, previous work with the district or something like that. I think that was the item. We get a, just a little bit of insight on uh, how that scoring all went down. Um, not sure who to turn to. Larry, perhaps Larry Berger. I know John Posh is also on the line, but this is um, uh, not original bond scope. So, um, yeah. Anybody? Hi. Hello. This is Latrina Bob, the director of purchasing. And um, I know Larry uh, Berger and Matt Klein could probably go a little bit more into detail about this. But yes, the low score did not uh, receive this award because they were the um, vendor who was um, who we used to do the roof um, for Challenger um, after the fire um, had um, to do some repairs to the roof after the fire. And there had been some issues with the roof since then. So they were not, um, I guess, confident in this vendor to move forward with this project. But like I said, that's just, you know, what I got from them, Larry Berger and Matt Klein would be able to go a lot more detail into that. But that is where, um, that's where their score got impacted. No, Ms. Yes, Bob, uh, I can go I can ahead. That. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the company uh, used by Alan, uh, Anselmo Bryant for all the projects, the elementary projects and the right. projects. Um, they had issues um, routinely with uh, communication, with supplies, uh, with the fire at mm -hmm. Challenger, with uh, setting off fire alarms, with breaking windows. There was just some accountability pieces that we did not want to re-engage them in the process, even though they were the low bid. Um, we didn't think that the uh, value was there based on the bid and their previous work. Okay. That's good enough. Thank you very much. All right. And so I pulled that. So I guess nobody else has any other questions. All right. Uh, hearing none, uh, is there, I'll move uh, <laughs> that we approve <laughs> uh, consent agenda item four. Second. Thank you. Motion good. Thank you. Decker. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, let's go ahead and vote. Uh, Gooden will vote aye. Uh, Decker? Aye. Carbone? Aye. Murphy? Aye. Botkin? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Trustees Floyd and Barry absent. Mr. Barry joined at 1244, Mr. Gooden. Ah, Mr. Barry joined. Okay, great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, all right. Item uh, A7. Um, I have to pull this as this is, uh, I work for communities and schools, so I'm going to have to recuse myself from this vote. So, all right. Okay, were there any uh, specific questions on the item? Well, since, since we pulled this, let me ask in, in the uh, in one of the programs that's mentioned in the in the exec well in the uh, write-up is the 21st century and i was just wondering that used to be at jameson but that grant ran out and are we looking at pursuing that and you know, if we don't have an answer right now just could we look at pursuing that for um i don't know the answer to that off the top of my head um uh, are you there um yeah no yeah, okay yeah sorry having trouble um we could certainly look at that i know that when they have the after school program um sometimes it's uh well the new it's, it's so many years on the ace program and i don't know if it can come back to that area but i know that uh, dr kelly's looking at other ideas on aftercare and stuff at different you know what we have to offer so i would have i could check on that for you Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Who knows what after school is going to look like? Right. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Any further discussion? All right. Hearing none, we will go to vote. Trustee was okay. There was a motion. Uh, there's a second. And okay. well, actually, um, I'll, move. A... I'll move. I'll move approval. I'll move approval. Uh, uh, Lance is aye. Okay, wait, Lance, would you second this for me, please? I, I need a second. I second. Okay, all right. Uh, motion and a second. That was Gooden and Botkin. 
All right, Trustee Carbone, how do you vote? Aye. Trustee Barry. Yeah, I just need you to reiterate the motion. I just stepped in when you know, after all that happened. Okay, the motion is uh, approval of the CIS contract, communities and schools. Okay, right. I'm an aye. All right, Barry is an aye. All right, Murphy. Aye. Botkin. Aye. Botkin is an aye. Gooden is an aye. Uh, the motion carries five zero with uh, Secretary Decker abstaining and Mr. Floyd absent. Okay, next item was consent agenda 10. Uh, Trustee Carbone. Yes, um, I was wondering if we could have a little bit further discussion about any updates that we've received about our um, appraisal values and what the, that rate is looking like for us. And um, do we have any information? I know there's been a lot of community conversations about um, hoping that our state leadership will change or put a hold on our appraisal values for this year and how those discussions are forming or what might be happening on that front. Yes, we do have some updates on that. Georgiani, uh, you're on top of that. You want to uh, brief the board on uh, appraisal values and impact sure. and so on. As far as the COVID-19 having an impact, um, that's not going to have an impact on the on the current values. However, there's a lot of protests, more than likely. We had about a, four, a little bit over 14% increase from prior year values, but we all know that that uh, increases lower significantly for certified values. So um, right now we're estimating um, about a 10.5, between 10.5 and 11 percent increase um, as certified in July. And so we're looking at uh, a decrease of about seven cents in the MNO tax rate. However, um, we are going to advertise safely and um, by law, if we advertise a rate that is lower than what it's going to end up being, we have to re-advertise again. So we're advertising uh, same rate pretty much. Um, and in July, TEA is going to conduct uh, a survey and they're going to ask us what our values are certified and they, they're going to determine what the tier one rate is and the tax rate is going to be adopted then after we get the uh, certified values and the rate from uh, TEA. But the bottom line is that our tax rate will be lower no matter what we do. And um, also, I, this is more for the general audience that might be listening. Um, the reason that the values are high is that they're calculated as of January 1st, which is three months before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So. Um, I know there's a lot of questions out there. How can, so, how can they be so high in, in the wake of the COVID-19? So our compressed rate is um, looking like it's gonna come in somewhere in the 80 something cent range? Yes, about 80, a little bit over 85. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so this value that we're approving today is the highest potential rate that it could be. You're actually not approving the value. You're just approving for us to publish the notice. We gotta send the notice to the newspaper by this Friday in order to meet the deadlines for the June 6th uh, board uh, adoption. Okay, and can you, were you gonna say something, Dr. Kelly, or somebody else? Well, I was gonna add one more thing. I'm glad you pulled this item that uh, Georgiani and I spoke this morning, uh, maybe a decision from our president on this, but we didn't specify the time of the day for the meeting on June the 9th. Uh, are we switching back to a five o'clock time for board right, meeting? Uh, yes. Yeah, so you, you, was that a question? I, I yes. I'm sorry, uh, Ms. President. Do you want to yes. hold the June 9th board meeting at five o'clock rather than this eleven o'clock time we've been using? Let's. I would like to return to the five o'clock time frame, but uh, pending. Say it again, Lance. Uh, I agree. Okay. All right. Yeah, but what I what I was intending to do, Dr. Kelly, is to consult more with you and with the board, and to see you know what the feel was, and even looking at maybe possibly that the June meeting could be in person, but uh, we'll yeah. see. Uh, but Charles, uh, the only reason I ask you about that right now is that um, uh, Danny pointed out we had to publish that notice tomorrow. I think it is. That's, that's right. Okay. Uh, well, members who who are here. Um, 
let's let's just what do you think about I'm I'm in favor of going back to the five o'clock. I'm in favor of five. Okay. Okay. I got Lance as well. Uh yeah, I'm in favor of five as well. Okay. All right. Uh Decker, Carbone. Yep, five is good. Five is good. Okay. We will go to the five o'clock time frame so we can put that into the uh, poster. And while we're still on item 10, um, I have another some follow up question or some a clear understanding of the INS side. Um, have you guys talked any more about a potential drop on the INS rate side? Yes, um, I met with John Roebuck, our financial advisor. And in the next budget workshop, if, if we have one, you know, he's going to go in depth. But there is uh, um, an opportunity for defeasing some debt, about $5 million. So the best thing that we're going to suggest for this uh, year is to, re, uh, to keep the same rate on the INS for this year. That way we can pay off some debt. And in turn, for the next uh, years, that, that INS rate is going to drop. So it won't drop for this year, it will drop for the next uh, tax year. Okay, and can, okay. I'm just trying to puzzle through that in my mind about mm -hmm. moving that cent over from INS over to m and and the value that that could get us in leveraging the state dollars there. And would we have to go out for a TRE in if we dropped the INS side and increased on the MNO side? So we can't do swaps, basically. Okay. We can't um, swap uh, INS to MNO in order to pay debt. Um, and that's more of a decision of the legislature this last right. time where they basically closed the door on tax swaps. Okay. So in any increase that we see on the MNO side would have to be through a TRE. Well, um, talk about that one golden penny. Uh, uh, yes, so so I do have a, a one penny that the legislature is allowing us for uh, this current fiscal year to increase one more cent. Uh, as you recall, the golden pennies, they increase from six cents to eight cents. We have four right now on top of our compressed rate. And so we're going for the fifth one. Um, anything above five uh, golden pennies, it requires a TRE. And uh, Georgiani, uh, am I right about this? It needs a unanimous vote of the board to move from four to five gold yes. pennies. Yes, that fifth uh, cent requires an, a unanimous vote. Mm -hmm. And what would be the state um, monetary contribution for that on top of what our taxpayer share would be? The total is about $2.5 million. And I believe the state is uh, about 1. 1. 1.6 to $1.7 million for that penny. So okay. say uh, a total of four pennies, both local and state would be $10 million. Okay. And in the next budget workshop, um, are you planning to give a presentation about what it would look like to keep the tax rate flat? Like basically going out for a TRE and what that could potentially look like? Yes, yes I will. Mm -hmm. And um, a part of that discussion is that from based on what you're saying, we're basically moving forward in the idea that we keep the INS rate the same this year and then look for the decrease to happen next year in an effort for us to be in a better financial standing on our debt structure side. Yes, uh, we have a big opportunity for a big drop in the in the tax rate on the INS side if we're able to defeat debt as well as do the, uh, the bond refunding of the high interest uh, rate bonds. Okay, so you'll um, clarify that much more in our yes. next budget workshop and kind of give us pretty graphs and all that stuff. You know, and that's, well, and that's also due to um, the, the high increase in the, in the rates, of course, you know, we're going to get a lot more revenues on the INS side. So that's going to help us to defeat the debt and then to lower the tax rate in the next uh, fiscal year. Okay. Yeah, you know, I was going to just add that what occurs to me is that, you know, we're under current funding formulas for this next year. And so we don't anticipate a real problem there, but the following two years, everybody's predicting significant cuts. So I think probably where Crystal's thinking is already going is what can we do for our folks then? And uh, if we can reduce our INS rate, that certainly will be a help. 
Mm -hmm. Because I think if we wait, and it sounds like to me what you guys are saying that we're going to be, like you just said, a, a fine financial situ situation going into the next fiscal year. But if we, I'm worried that if we don't act now, that the resources were going to dry up and we will have acted too late in, a set, in essence by not acting now. When we have the opportunity because of the steep compression rate that we could benefit from some piece and still give our taxpayers a significant kind of compression of that tax rate. Um, and I'm worried that if we don't kind of build the lake now to get the water flow later, um, mm -hmm. if that's a good analogy, I don't know. You're right on it that. Is. It's a good one. Yep. I concur with that. So I guess we'll continue having these discussions as we move forward in the budget workshops. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, I, let's see, this split screen thing is difficult to get to the. Item 10. Yeah, what page is it on there? Uh, or if someone else has it in front of them, if they want to read the motion, I'll be 54. 54, page 54. Thank you. All right, so I'll make a motion that the board approves Tuesday, June 9th as the date to hold public meeting to discuss the 2021 budget to publish the required notice with a proposed tax rate of 1.3920 per $100 valuation. Second. Second. Motion Carbone, second Decker. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, Trustee Carbone, how do you vote? Aye. Trustee Barry? Aye. Trustee Murphy? Aye. Trustee Botkin? Aye. Gooden votes aye. Trustee Decker? Aye. Motion carries 6 0 with Trustee Floyd absent. All right, outstanding. All right. Thank you all very much for that insight. Okay. As I noted, I'm going to move up now the report on the work of the Cultural Responsive Committee and to be directly followed by Dr. Kelly's update on uh, COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Miles, the floor is yours. Okay, great. <clears throat> uh, basically what uh, the committee and council has come to at this point is to, we are at a place that we need to continue uh, exploring uh, opportunities to bridge gaps, to empower our school leaders, to make sure that we are on the right page with sensitivity and preparing our campuses uh, for unique situations that could come up, may or may not. But um, we want to continue doing research that suggests best practices for us, that empower us as uh, leaders in our campus to have all of those um, difficult conversations and do the things that we need to do and confront and do it with confidence. So I think that's one of our major priorities, just to update with the council is one of our focus, our main focuses. Um, we also want to continue to grow our campus teams. Recently with this new um, council's um, immersion, we have, as campus principals, started building smaller councils on each campus so that we have active people that are engaged in uh, protocols that's going to help us make good decisions and one person's not making a decision that we may not be thinking clearly through. We believe sometimes some of these hard things that we confront takes a team. So we are growing campus CRC teams. Um, we are also uh, doing a lot of research with restorative practice and merging with our district leadership team that is merging the PBIS model to the secondary level, which we're growing that model up to the secondary model and merging it with restorative practice. Um, COVID-19, of course, has put a little wrench in our plan as some of the uh, protocols and training that we wanted to move forward with quite aggressively, and we're really not able to do a lot of it. But a lot of campus principals have committed to carrying out the training that we have already been exposed to with our campus teams uh, over our summer retreats and doing those things so that our campus becomes vested in the practice already up front. Um, we will be speaking with uh, Noelle Gray and having her uh, 
gauge us in the process of what PBIS looks like at the secondary level. Right now it's at elementary and to move that, we believe that immersion is gonna help us be very sensitive to cultural practices, cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, as we merge those two with the respect, be safe, be responsible, merging that into restorative practice to make sure that we're covering all um, areas of, of the integration of those two models. Um, we believe as the council, uh, it is important for us to stay very active with uh, parents in the community. We have parents that sit on our council that bring us information and hot topics and things that we need to be uh, enlightened to so that we are not overlooking things and making sure that we are really on top of sensitive things that could be building and we are not always aware of. You know, campus principals, we get so consumed with making sure that we're taking care of academics, taking care of UIL, taking care of all those other things. Sometimes we may miss those critical pieces that we think can affect culture, can affect um, the climate of a campus in a district. So we wanna be sensitive to those things and keep our parents and community engaged and be transparent and have opportunities to talk about those things such as discipline, um, teaching and learning, what it looks like across cultural uh, boundaries and to make sure that we are reaching the hardest to reach population. Um, we have found that across this pandemic, the hardest to reach population has been our ESL children. Very difficult to get connected with them. And we know at this point, we have not been able to really engage them. And we, and moving forward, if we're here again, from a cultural perspective, they are part of our, our big scheme of things. And we have to be prepared to get to them and be able to actively engage them in the learning process as well. So I think we're being open to a lot of those things, making sure that we're not missing anything, giving our community, giving our parents, giving our students a voice in the whole process so that we understand where people are coming from and not overlooking uh, anyone's emotions. We get tied into emotions, but emotions drive perception, which drives what people think which become reality. So we, we, we wanna be open and transparent when it comes to those things in our council. One thing I did wanna share is one of our last meetings was pretty powerful. Um, I had all of our members assemble, we had technology available and we were able to really work through that Harvard, that Harvard implicit bias test and it was eye opening for the council. Parents were there, our active members were there and it gave us a sensitivity to look at some of the things that we subconsciously don't even pay attention to, but it really affects our decision making. So that test really opened my eyes. Um, Mrs. Serrano was there with me, Dr. Vaughn was there, Dr. Allen, uh, the committee, uh, Ms. Holcott was there. We were able to really see that implicitly we don't think about some of the things that we do that could come across and, and present issues for us. So I think the more transparent we are, the more uh, aware we are, the more open we are about it, the more sensitive we are to listen and, and hear people out when things become hot and heavy, it helps us make good decisions and uh, we all know right now, it's so easy to say that we're fine, we're fine, we're fine, but underneath it all, mental health, COVID-19, where we are, is going to present some issues that we have to really be in tune to moving back and coming forward. So as the council chair, I've been doing a lot of research on merging those things, making sure that we're ready to move forward with the integration of PBIS and restorative practice and doing research that is not one-sided. I think it's important for a council, a council to look at all possibilities. If this is not a sole practice that is gonna work, we have to be willing to explore other options as well. We think restorative is 100% a way to go, but we also wanna make sure that we're not gonna get so sucked up into making sure that we're 
trying to make things right and we lose our academic focus. So we got to be careful that we're really exposing all of it. And being an active researcher myself, I don't want to be lopsided or one-sided on how we function as a council. I want to make sure that we are visible, transparent, active, and engaged with the parents community and making sure that we're doing what's right for kids, doing what's right for our staff, and making sure that we're making good sound decisions and not letting some of those internal things drive us. So in a nutshell, um, we as a council believe there is, there's a need to continue our work as a council. This, it, it's something that happens over time. Nothing that we need to do is an immediate fix. It's going to take continuous a work, continuous research, continuous conversations like this, continuous collaboration, and uh, so that we're able to really meet the changing demographics of our district to make sure everyone feels like they have a place, that they're able to move forward, that we're able to make sure all of our populations can excel and be successful, no matter what that looks like. You know, a former military lady, whatever it takes. You know, that's what we're willing to do. So I, I think that in a nutshell is, a, is an update of where we are as a council, uh, being willing and open and whatever it looks like, whatever directives we have, to be able to come together with the experts that have all of the answers and have good sound resources that we can tap into that will help us. Thank you so much, Dr. Miles. Uh, any uh, board members want to Time in with any questions or discussion? Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, I, I got a couple things. So, Dr. Miles, my um, when we first when we had our first update on the uh, CRC, um, one of the things we talked about the PBIS uh, implementation, uh, moving that from you know grade levels on up from K through K through four on up, and then one of the things I brought up was cultural deficit thinking. And what I'm hearing is that your, your team is really attacking that so that when, when our staff, when we look at our kids, we just see our kids, right? And we understand the cultural differences and we understand what we got to do to be sensitive. Um, but it, it's going to help us reach more kids, right? And uh, help us avoid uh, issues. And so my, my question is, are the CRC teams that are going to be on the campuses the primary vehicle to where we see that training and those expectations set on every campus? Uh, our intention, I believe, as a council is to make sure that those CRC teams are trained in okay. restorative practice. They're confident in cultural sensitivity, cultural awareness, some of those high profile issues, some of those things that some people truly shy away from. Our expectation and mine as the chair is to make sure those teams are those practitioners that do understand how some of the things that we say can be perceived and be able to empower our staff as a result of those councils. So okay. the councils become the training mechanism that go out, hold the restorative practices, uh, circles, uh, inform the community, inform, hold parent meetings become the vehicle so that even if a teacher is in an awkward place and isn't quite sound with what, what I'm thinking, where I'm going, you have an immediate chain to kind of help so that people don't feel isolated. You know, the, I think the hardest thing is sometimes is not knowing what to say. Mm -hmm. Like it's an awkward position and, and instead of kind of thinking it out, sometimes we just say it or do it. So I think our council is trying to create teams that will then help bridge that so that we are empowered to make better decisions and maybe not wind up in a deficit versus in a positive place. Okay. And we, when we talked about PBIS and some of these other things, we talked about that there would be at some point in time uh, dollars required to implement. And I, I don't know if you started to develop or special programs start to develop any you know, budgets uh, but uh, definitely, if you have any insight on that, I'd love to hear it, but um, definitely, yeah. Well, I have Dr. Nixon is, of course, here with me, and I, I think it's going to be a true collaboration that we're able to work because I don't think 
in, in my mind, I don't envision a CRC as something that's temporary or something that's just kind of floating along. I, I, I view this council as a vehicle to uh, connect to the district leadership team so that all those areas that we, we need to be on top of and confront, it's an integrated approach. So as far as a dollar amount in moving PBIS, I know it's gonna involve some training at the campus levels, some signage, some um, firsthand information coming from experts that are much better to deliver this information, which I'm willing to do it. If you want, I love to deliver some of this information. I'm, I believe I could be a good spokesperson in some of these cases on even on campuses if I had to. But I think it's going to take a collaborative effort between special programs, even CIS, even, you know, so that we merge these efforts and it's not an isolated approach. I believe it needs to be integrated to how we think, how we work, how we are, this is who we are, and that integrated approach permeates out. So as far as a true dollar amount, I believe the person that can best answer that may be Dr. Nixon, who can kind of contribute to some of those uh, amounts. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nixon, before you start, I know that um, with the PBIS, we, we have talked about the restorative justice, um, you know, being trained. At this yes. point, how, I know that we were, we started with an initial group of uh, principals and then we added assistant principals and counselors. Have we gone as far as added teachers now? Or do we have trainers of trainers and we're starting to implement that throughout the campuses? I, I think, okay. that, Dr. Miles, um, we had planned to have uh, Dr. Gail Lang uh, here in the district to meet with all administrators, principals and assistant principals um, for them to have that initial training so they could start thinking about teachers bringing in. Um, unfortunately, TEA will not allow Dr. Lang to do any in-person training. And so we're delayed a little bit um, due to the COVID closure. We do have, uh, with Dr. Miles and with Bonnie Scheidt, um, we'll be meeting with Dr. Lang in July. And so that leadership team will come back together with Dr. Lang to kind of see how we push that training forward. So it's going to look a little different than what we had planned out. Um, unfortunately, I know, um, like Dr. Miles, many of the principals had their people go to TK while we still could early this spring. Um, and so they're aware of teachers that are interested. We've done some trainings, even on our special education back to school last year, we had people training teachers. We had probably about 150 to 200 teachers that participated in that brief, you know, circles with your students kind of uh, training. So we're working on it. It's just, we're gonna have to kind of adjust that plan now due to the school closures. Yeah, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I ask, um, how often is the CRC currently meeting? Uh, currently, we've met monthly, but uh, right before the closure, we met bi-monthly because we, of course, had just invited parents that had joined with us and we had to review the vision, review the mission and those things. So we've met five times since the council is formed. Okay, and you do have parents from across the district and a good cross section that's participating in the conversations. I think if we sought out parents, we could probably recruit several, but I think we have a good, well rounded voice. Um, we also have teachers from across the district as well, so I think that's helpful. And I believe a lot of the members were nominated by some people that I think some kind of way they kind of made their way to our circle, but have been very vocal, very actively engaged in the process, really bringing some good information from a whole diverse uh, process, a diverse background coming from all sides of Pearland for sure. Okay, and you feel like you have all the parties that you need at the table as far as upper administration to be able to push forward ideas for the funding pieces and such. Yes, ma'am. Okay. At this point, we have representatives from every department that are there with us. And again, you know, the model that we're trying to build and integrate, it requires 
from top on down to see it, feel it, understand it, because it looks different for everyone. Yeah, I feel like no, it's- I feel like we have a very good represented population. I feel like in some ways it's over pouring and overlaying a new foundation on top of the solid foundation that we have. Um, it's kind of creating a new one to continue building on. And um, I appreciate your effort and your work. I know you're passionate about it and I appreciate everything you're doing to carry this torch forward. I agree with you that I think this is a great start and there's a large future in front of us. And so I'm excited about that. Um, the only other question I have is, have you guys had discussions about outreach to those students that are um, EL students and their families about how you think we might be able to be creative and outreach to those families? Sure, sure. we have talked about uh, this uh, issue in both CNI meetings, in our middle school principal meetings. We've talked about it in my own campus principal meetings my admin meetings with my teams. We've done everything from merging with Susan Holloway's office and literally sending, we've gone to houses and we know it's dangerous, but we have gone out to homes. We've called, we've emailed, we've virtually Zoomed in with many of them. It's some have left, some are out of the state. Some we just have not been able to connect and um, we want to definitely be on top of that in the event we wind up, find, a, find ourselves back here again. Okay. So yeah, we're, I think we've explored every opportunity. Our special programs, case managers are active every day. They are on the phone. They are engaged with teachers and, and really trying to reach out to make sure that we don't miss anyone. So I think moving forward, we just, ha we have to, expect the unexpected and be ready to get down and dirty when it happens. And that's pretty much what, what we kind of wound up with. All of my kids at this point that have not been engaged have literally been due to those uh, situations. Everyone else, 85% to 90% have been actively engaged in our remote learning. So that population, we really, really, really have to figure out how to get some them. cohesive plan to get them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Miles. Yes, thank you. Okay, anything further from any other members? Any other input from uh, staff? All right, uh, Dr. Miles, thank you so much for your work uh, and leadership. And Dr. Nixon, thank you so much for your input. Thank you. We really appreciate y'all pushing forward this vital work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Kelly, we will pull the floor uh, to you for the uh, report on school district matters associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, it's hard to believe, but this is actually the, the last week of school. It doesn't feel that way, but um, it is. Originally, graduation would have occurred uh, this Friday. Um, our attention for the most part now is directed towards, uh, a little bit towards the summer and, and especially towards the fall. And I'll be telling you uh, quite a bit about that. Um, yesterday, uh, Governor Abbott uh, in the afternoon, late afternoon, um, started issuing more reopening orders. And then along with that, we got very uh, specific TA guidance on how that refers or how that uh, is relevant to schools, particularly summer school. And I sent you a link uh, this morning, uh, trustees, uh, to show you the extensive list of guidelines and rules that the governor um, has put into place for anyone who wants to offer summer school. Now for us, we uh, already uh, are planning and, and uh, ready to provide virtual summer school uh, online. We have everything from bilingual K-1 required summer school to high school acceleration uh, things. We don't anticipate at this point that we're gonna try a in-person uh, type of summer school, but we are uh, getting ready obviously for that uh, for the coming year. And as you know, uh, I have a return to work, a return to school, I'm sorry, a return to school committee uh, that's been meeting. Um, I think we just finished our third meeting from right about that yesterday, um, looking at a whole bunch of things. And I think what I might do is just um, kind of show you uh, 
some of the things that Governor Abbott put out yesterday and how they relate to what we're going to do. Um, because I think that there are a preview. In other words, um, what the governor said about summer is very likely. Staff are covered on that, things like what to look for and how to protect yourself and, 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 and all that kind of thing. Um, right now, he's saying for summer school that there should be no more than 11 students, uh, 10 students and one teacher together in a room or in a setting, in a classroom setting for summer school. Um, and of course, even in that situation, desks would be six feet apart, etc. There will be no assemblies. Um, no. Uh, the closest thing would be there would be some groups allowed out of doors with certain distancing things built in. Um, there are uh, this summer there's no uh opening for gyms or uh, weight rooms in associated with that instruction now i just got a notice this morning from the uil allowing some strength and conditioning uh weight room type stuff to open this summer so i'm not sure how those two things fit together yet um they're talking about uh, as much as possible promoting self-contained classes you know at the elementary level rather than having the kids move around all day, uh, having the kids in the same location and maybe moving teachers around. Um, he talked about, if possible, taking the temperature of uh, people as they enter the building. And uh, we, uh, Ms. Berger and others have been looking into that, um, the technology involved in that um, as a possibility for us to do. That isn't without its own set of problems in terms of lining people up and getting them through and all that. Uh, making hand sanitizers available, that uh, work, uh, Larry has already been working, Mr. Berger has already been working on that. He's, uh, he's ordering large quantities of, of uh, masks uh, and uh, hand sanitizer units that would be positioned at key locations within the school building. Um, basically, uh, uh, the governor has said for summer school, everyone, all employees will wear masks, um, that we develop entry and exit procedures. Uh, he recommends that uh, all students eat lunch at their desk. And we've been looking into that, uh, all of those things separately from him, uh, how we would do lunch if the pandemic restrictions are still in place. Um, and then he even talked about uh, employee absences, how we assume that there will be more employee absences in that scenario and how we would uh, deal with that. Um, here, just to, one thing that I've been telling the return to school committee is I call it the tail wagging the dog. If we don't get transportation right, everything else doesn't matter. In other words, if you have right now, we have a capacity for school buses of up to 72, 73 kids. But obviously under social distancing, that cannot happen. So as Mr. Kopp, our, our transportation director has looked at that and plotted it out, we're looking at only 12 to 18 students uh, on a bus at one time. And then of course cleaning to happen afterwards. So that radically changes a lot of things. And it in turn drives the school schedule. And maybe I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but anyway, um, if we don't get transportation right, nothing else matters because we've got to keep the kids from getting infected on the way to school and on the way home is basically the point there. Um, the governor has allowed youth sports to begin, I forget his date for that, maybe June 1st also, but, um, so some of that, and so I take that as a prediction that there will be an effort to open more and more sports, and then that may in turn drive UIL decisions as we, uh, as we go forward. Um, okay. Uh, a couple of immediate things. Um, return to work provisions. Basically, the way that we've operated since the COVID ep uh, pandemic started is to say work from home unless we see you as only being able to work from the office 
and, and, and we're, we're about to flip that as of June 1st. We're, we're more inclined now to say, okay, there's an expectation, particularly here in the ESC, that you are at work but there will be exceptions for people with underlying medical conditions, for uh, people that are in uh, the higher age group, for uh, offices in which um, social distancing could be a problem unless we limit and, uh, and, and rotate uh, who comes in. So we're kind of making that slow switch. Um, many districts around us already have implemented that as early as May, beginning of May, but we have been very, very cautious about all that. Um, custodians, uh, as we move into the fall, as you probably know, board, uh, most of our custodians work at night and they, um, you know, they're cleaning up the facility. We have one custodian maybe during the day that's doing that kind of work. Well, that will flip. And so we'll have the majority of our custodians working during the day, uh, cleaning up and disinfecting all day long, uh, surfaces and so on. Um, now, in terms of what the overall school district might look like, we in the return to school committee are looking at three scenarios and we need to be prepared for all three. One scenario is a return to somewhat normal type campus on campus instruction. How do we do that normal routine or new normal? The second one is a totally online environment such as we've had to experience over the last whatever it's been, eight weeks or so. And the third one, which is the most likely one, is a hybrid between uh, being on campus with, for some things and distance learning. And basically, one of the things that are obvious from the eight weeks that we've spent is that if we want kids to be connected to what we're doing, there must be face-to-face, in-person teaching, and interaction going on. Otherwise, it's gonna be very difficult uh, to have students accountable for and to know what they're doing, where they're at, attendance and everything else. So, and, and, and for the listening audience here, please understand that these are some initial ideas before you uh, see them as, as what we're gonna do. But so far, what the committee has considered is that uh, in grades pre-K through four, under a system where there was a necessity, a strong necessity for social distancing and all of that, that in pre-K through four, we might go to half day school with half of the school meeting in the morning and half in the afternoon um, in order to better uh, accommodate uh, social distancing. Um, that presents problems, don't, don't get me wrong. Obviously, what, what do you do about daycare in the afternoon or in the morning when, when the parent doesn't have that? And uh, we have some ideas along those lines. Uh, it's gonna require cooperation with daycare providers, churches, other entities. It's also going to be a restructuring of how we employ our own personnel, our own aides and, and so on. At the secondary level, well, I should say from grades five through 12, uh, we're looking at an every other day approach, meaning that half the kids would be here on, a, let's say, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, while the other ones are at home distance learning, and then that switches on Tuesday and Thursday. And um, all of the nuances that go uh, with that. The good part about that is, is if you have to do distance learning and you get to eyeball your kids two or three times a week, it's much more likely to have the attendance, the accountability, the follow through, the grades and everything else that are needed. So again, I wanna caution, these are not absolutes. We don't know if we, what combination we have to employ, if, if any, but we have to be ready for the all encompassing problem of social distancing in terms of how we hold school and adhere to those, um, to those things. So, um, I mean, I could go on and on here. Um, one thing that uh, we have learned from the eight weeks here uh, that I think all of you will resonate with is uh, the uh, desire by parents to move towards what we call one software platform, meaning that um, if you're a, a parent of 
different ages, kids, it's very confusing to be like on five or six different software platforms. So where our thinking is at this point is that the overarching one will be Canvas and it is uh, particularly of use from grades five and up. For grades pre-K through four, Canvas just, as we're studying, it just doesn't hack it that well. And so what will happen in grades K through four is, uh, pre-K through four, is a lot more use of Seesaw. And um, instead of having five or six different entities controlling these things, we hope to get it down to one at the uh, five through 12, sorry I said, five through 12, and, and another one at pre-K through four. Again, no final decisions on that, but we're working towards that listening to our uh, parents. Um, we, uh, we recognize that um, there will be mental health needs uh, that are associated with COVID pandemic um, for both students and staff. And so uh, the board's heard a little bit about that already. Uh, we're recommending tonight, and the board has initially been the, the, the pusher behind this, but additional support counselors for the junior highs. Also, um, we're looking at how we might address that with uh, address similar things for our staff. Uh, much more work to do on all of that. Uh, food in the fall could look like um, you go down to the cafeteria in a line of some kind to pick up your food and then it's so that you have the ability to choose your food, but then you are taking it back to your classroom to eat it. Um, we'll see how that uh, develops. A lot of uh, professional development for our teachers and staff this summer and fall will be online as opposed to in person. This could even mean our famous convocation at the beginning of the uh, year or a week before the year. We'll see how all that uh, comes together. Uh, as uh, Mr. Moody has mentioned in executive session, um, we have issues to work through on the use of uh, coaches and fine arts people and so on if uh, the UIL does not reopen, if the UIL does not allow practices and, um, and games. And if so, then uh, those teacher slash coaches would be used in other capacities. Um, those would include, um, of course, teaching and reaching out to students, but it also may address uh, bus driver shortages, which could be anticipated. Remember that uh, bus drivers, um, as a demographic, often are retired folks, older, more susceptible to the pandemic and, uh, and underlying health conditions. And so we've got to be prepared for that um, and realizing that we're, we just may need more buses, um, which means more routes, et cetera. Mr. Kopp has been tremendous. He's been working on school schedules that would get us, get our kids to and from school under that idea of a K through four uh, half day and a five through 12 every other day approach and what that would mean and how many routes. But it is uh, still, that social distancing problem is enormous. Um, we offer paid bus service if you live within two miles of the school. Can we continue that? Or if we continue that, do we need to reduce it and say, well, we'll provide paid service for those living more than one mile rather than zero uh, miles? So a lot of issues like that to work on as we go through. Let me, uh, oh, uh, one other thing that I need to bring back to you in, the, uh, in June. We have begun to think that no matter what we do, if every kid does not have individual access to technology for those parts of the day when they are at home, then we're not going to get where we need to go. And so we are uh, leaning towards bringing to you in June, uh, basically moving towards a one-to-one -one initiative where kids in grades K through two, I think that's right, uh, Greg, uh, K through two or K through one. It's pre-K through two. Pre-K through two, sorry about that, uh, would receive uh, iPads and grades three and above would receive the tablet slash uh, 
Uh, I'm sorry, I misled you. It's pre-K through one, you're, you're right. Okay. And two through 12 would have a laptop. Okay. So that's, uh, obviously that's a lot of money. Now, I, I'm, I'm not so much concerned about the money for that because we can use our fund balance. But as Greg would be quick to point out, that's going to need a lot of support, personnel support to work on uh, computers that don't work or distribution and collection and all those kinds of things. So we're still working through that, but um, because of our financial situation in this district, we've avoided the one-to-one -one, uh, deal. We've, we've concentrated more on bring your own device and, and, and iPad carts and other things, but in this new era, we don't think that works. And so uh, we'll be more definite about that as we bring it to you. Um, Dr. Kelly, thank you very much for that insight. May I interrupt you real quick? Uh, yes, Trustee sir. Murphy, yeah, no, no, Trustee Murphy has his hand up. Uh, yes, Mr. Sir. Murphy, you had a question? Yeah, just, I guess, forward thinking about the bus route, um, are, has the state mentioned at all, I guess, you guys are thinking this up, about reimbursing us or increasing the cost or payments or anything? Because I guess if you think about half days, you got to pick up, drop off, pick up, drop off. So. Not only does it increase fuel buses, it also increases the bus driver salary, correct? Yeah, now, um, off the top of my head, the legislature changed the way that they funded routes this last year. So um, I, 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 I think what remains is the ability to charge per route, whether it's half day or full day. So I think in a way that helps us. But no, you, the answer to your larger question is they have not addressed at all during the COVID-19 whether there would be enhanced funding or additional funding or hazardous duty, hazardous route funding uh, going forward. Nothing yet. Okay. And just to clarify, Dr. Go ahead, sorry. No, 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 I, I was gonna, go ahead, Crystal. Um, so just to clarify on the laptop and iPad piece, you're saying all students. Yes, sir, right. yes, ma'am. Okay. And have we kind of researched i know that there are several districts in our area that have moved to this route long before we have and kind of um been able to learn from their yes. weak spots or their faux pas or where they stumbled or whatever to be able to maybe implement this a little bit more streamlined i mean it's technology there's always going to be stuff yeah yes uh now uh, yes and no the no part is that we just kind of recently came to the idea that we've got to go to one one This is a fairly recent realization. But over the last couple of years, we have been watching the clear creeks of the world and others and the mistakes they've made as well as the successes they've had. And they would be the first to tell you they made some major mistakes, which we hope to not uh, repeat. Now, it's one advantage of us getting late in the game as compared to some districts is that we can learn from previous uh, distributions of all those things. Do you have an initial kind of sticker price on what this would look like? I asked Mr. Barté to give me that, but it was only two or three days ago, so I'm not going to put him on the spot on that yet. Uh, We're but still it's, negotiating. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, Greg had an interesting idea, which was, um, you know, he moved from, we're going to have to have people on campus to handle all the maintenance and technician needs to having a more centralized approach. And then his latest idea to me, which apparently he's going to talk to Dell or whoever, is maybe we contract for services that uh, Dell could provide us uh, for fixing broken ones, replacing them, all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. that's going to be a very large price tag. And so I, I'm, I don't want to say too much until I, I'm ready to bring that to you next month. Hey, Dr. Kelly, did you have an estimate on how many devices that is? Yeah, at this point, it's about 22,000 devices. So we're talking about starting from scratch across the board, even those that we've re distributed over the last few weeks, we're talking about making kind of a whole holistic approach and starting from scratch. Yeah. I, think, I think there will be some carryover, but the problem is this, at the younger grade levels, we really don't want the kids bringing their iPad back and forth to school every day. Um, and uh, what we've done with some of these already is we've repurposed older machines. Whether, I, I, and I have to defer to Greg on this, whether some of that remains viable or not, or whether, uh, as, as Krista puts it, we're starting completely from scratch. I haven't gone there yet. 
Yeah, what we what we did is we we had uh, identified laptops um, that we knew were due for refresh, and because there was a chance we could get some federal funding back from that, it's turned out that they're not going to help us much at all. But it was nice to be able to at least be in a position if they would, we could take advantage of it by buying the 400 that we had, and we had kept the original teacher uh, tablets, which still were better than what a lot of the districts around us were handing out with Chromebooks and things of that nature. Uh, we were able to just repurpose that to get us through the end of the school year. So yes, it, I would say it is absolutely a start from scratch, holistic approach. Uh, uh, Ms. Carter and I have talked about what's gonna have to happen from a, a general operating budget to put funding back to refresh these things in four years. So it, there, there's a whole process to this thing that's gonna. So be. I'm glad you said it like that. Um, there are some families out there that have the opinion that kind of the Chromebook and Google Classroom is the paramount choice and the ideal situation. What is your opinion about Chromebooks and Google Classroom and such? It's interesting you mentioned Chromebook because Dr. Kelly's right. We've learned from other things around our district. Most of those Chromebooks, they don't have cameras. So uh, what districts were finding is they were having to buy cameras to add to them, which is like a net cam. By the time you invest in the Chromebook and the camera, you've spent the same thing you would have if you would just given them uh, a laptop, a 13 inch laptop. Yeah, I, I would also just add, this is anecdotal, just sort of the circle of superintendents that some that have went to Chromebooks, particularly in South Missouri County, there's some regrets about that um, in terms of capabilities. And then yeah. the Google Classroom piece? Um, the Google Classroom is the same thing as, as what you get with Canvas. Um, it's just a learning management system. So uh, we have, a, a, I think, which is a better platform with Canvas. It's geared more towards uh, growing the kids. We, we, well, we've always targeted that fifth grade. We started at the high schools because it would get those kids ready for college quicker. And then we moved it to the junior highs. And this year we've moved it into the middle schools. But yeah. the, the Google Classroom is the same thing as a Canvas. It's just a learning management system. Yeah, I'm not up on Google Classroom, uh, Crystal, but TEA itself and, uh, and, and increasingly higher education are using Canvas. And so um, it, it behooves us to move in that direction. And now if Laura Reeves was here, she would tell you that it's superior uh, to the other. She's been pushing that for what, three years now, I think. Um, actually, since she got here. <laughs> yeah. We've had Canvas for about eight years and she is here. Oh. There, um, as far as looking at your learning management systems, Canvas is comparable to Blackboard, which um, if you're familiar with learning management systems, it's a very expensive learning management system. Um, Canvas does much more than Google Classroom. Okay. Google Classroom is akin to just their suite of products. Okay. Any sort of learning module type scenario. Okay, kind of it's similar to our Microsoft Office kinds of thing. Correct, correct. Okay. Right. Um, with one, one thing I was going to add there, Laura, is that you've been working in Greg and, and our CNI department, everybody. We're going to insist that our teachers and staff uh, are up on Canvas and up on Teams, Microsoft Teams, which is um, basically the competitor to Zoom. Um, there's an expectation built in that but as the school year begins that our teachers and staff are proficient in both. Yes, and I would go a step further to make sure that our pre-K through uh, fourth grade teachers are also very well versed in using Seesaw since that will be their learning platform as well. So will there be training for those staff members over the summer, um, kind of walk through and step through it. So there'll be some work required of them over summer to prep for the fall. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. We will offer, we begin uh, most of our summer training in July when the EdTech specialists come back. So we're in the process of developing uh, the missing components. We've been training uh, on Canvas and Seesaw for quite some time, but now uh, we will gear it and work with uh, curriculum and instruction to make sure that we are focused on uh, what does online learning really look like 
Awesome. Thank uh, you. What, one thing, uh, and I'm a little off that subject, but one thing I, that helps me to clarify all this is that uh, I'm telling this to the return to school committee. We need to think about the hardest to reach kids and plan for what we would do for them because the easy to reach kids and so on would benefit mm -hmm. from all that. But yeah. for example, uh, we have one elementary school where we had five students that we could not reach during this eight week period. How can we reach those kids? Are they uh, because their parents don't speak English or don't have the education or what is it that is preventing us from getting them what they need? And if we can do a good job of that, it will migrate itself to the other 21,000 plus students um, that we're serving. So if we can look at it like that, and, and that's part of what makes me think about the one-to-one -one initiative is if we can put everybody with what they need in their hands and as much as possible, it's right there on the machine, then um, we're moving the whole district forward. If I might offer Dr. Kelly, one of the biggest complaints we heard from kind of upper level campuses when we were out talking with teachers at luncheons and things was that uh, we think of students now as very versatile in technology because they have a device in front of them all the time, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily know where the power button is, how mm -hmm. to access the opening and saving a document. And mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. what we think is the basic tenets of how to use a computer is a loop to them. And mm -hmm. so I think we're going to have to go in and, and really teach some of those skills, those foundational skills before we can kind of teaching to read before we read to learn mm -hmm. that we're going to have to teach the technology before we can expect some kids are going to be well-versed and have every ability to use it. But from what I've heard from some of those kids that are hard to reach, they don't even know how to open the computer and access the tools that they need. Therefore, 100%. how, how 100%. can they be able to Agree. learn? Um, I also say that uh, we have a much lesser problem, but it exists with even our teachers and staff, some of our teachers and staff not having the level of proficiency needed in this new era. Personally, I believe that the whole world from an economic point of view is moving towards much more of an online, uh, instruction and so I see that th this COVID-19 has been the mother of necessity but it's going to it, it's permanent and and uh, and particularly at the high school level I think more and more and more is going to move to online so what we've said to each other is and Dr. Watson has been the key person on this is to the degree we can we need to make it seamless between what happens in the classroom face to face with technology right there and what happens at home if, if, if technology becomes easy for the kid to use at school and they're in the middle of using it for a curriculum and other activities there at school, then to a degree we've solved the problem you just identified, Crystal, at home. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Watson, do you wanna add anything to that? Uh, you're muted. Mm -mm. You're still muted. <laughs> You're, you're muted, Dr. Watson. Well, she, she unmuted, but I don't think her microphone works on her oh, computer. Okay. Well, D Dr. Kelly, can I add something to what yeah. Crystal was saying? Um, we ran into the same problem when we went to the online textbooks, where I guess we in education made some assumptions about kids and technology, that we were no longer teaching keyboarding or typing. And when we were on the campuses as, a, as technology administrators, watching and working with the teachers, moving and making this shift to online textbooks, we had kids that literally could not log themselves in. And we're not talking about kindergartners, first graders, we're talking about fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. And it's because the attitude was that they're immersed in technology and they are, they have cell phones and they type like this with their thumbs. You don't use a keyboard that way. So we added that back in and teach keyboarding now starting in kindergarten moving forward. So you're right, there are some assumptions that have been made over the years. We just need to make sure we do a good job of, of picking up those those deficiencies and identifying them. Um, but the accountability piece that Dr. Kelly talks about, uh, Ms. Weimer, uh, she has a committee that Dr. Kelly kind of, I, I guess he he handed it to her as her, as her focus, and it's the non-negotiables, it's the silo committee. There are things and clear expectations that deal with technology, deal with the learning management systems and, and using it ongoing in the classroom, even if the kids do come back. 
because we need to make sure they have the skills. Even if it's not for remote learning, they're going to need them for the job force. So. And I would like to piggyback off of what Greg just said, because one of the important components that we have developed is the uh, teacher technology proficiencies. And that document um, has been in use for about the past three or four years. It's part of the T test teacher self assessment and the teachers complete it every year and determine what their skill level is according to um, things like Skyward, Edgephoria, use of their uh, hardware in the classroom, use of their online textbooks, um, learning management systems. We've now added uh, for the next school year, Seesaw will be on there, uh, Teams will be on there. So it, it's really looking at the skill set of all of our teachers so that they are able to work with their students in whether it's face to face or online and we can actually uh, pull reports to show principals okay here here are some training areas that we think would be beneficial for your campus and from what i heard from teachers on campus that if you give me one particular training about a thing that i can learn to do um, and how to manipulate that and practice it in that training, I walk away being much more proficient in it and giving me small nuggets of those kinds of trainings versus something where I'm throwing all kinds of ideas in one training and here's a PowerPoint and here's different things you can use. And then I don't, I walk away with a broad brush, but I don't know how to fine tune any of those things. Absolutely. And so that's why it's important for us to really uh, be specific when we are delivering that professional development and give teachers time to practice. Mm -hmm. oh, so, um, okay. A couple of years, several years ago, we had a big talk about technology and the bond and, and all the things that were moving. And I still, and even today, am, am lacking the vision of where our district is going with technology. It seems like to me, I didn't see the vision before. It seems like we were taking care of pieces of the puzzle that needed to be taken care of. However, I'm not seeing the vision. I did see it back then. I haven't seen it since. Maybe we're getting the vision now. Uh, maybe Mr. Berger could answer that question. I, you know, since he's over that department. I, you know, I'm just trying to piece all this together because you're fixing to ask us for another probably 10 plus million dollars laptops or, or whatever it looks like for one to one. And we spent 22 million or a little less than 22 million in the bond. And I'm still trying to piece all this together. So, I, you know, well, it's my, hard for my, me to grasp. My initial comments are that the technology spending we've done so far are the basics. We, we have not been able to keep up with the Joneses in surrounding districts, but we've provided a very uh, robust infrastructure that can grow. And we've, uh, we've supplied what we could. We've, we've tried to make up for deficiencies with BYOD and with iPad carts and sort of halfway measures. Uh, but one good thing that has emerged out of this COVID uh, period of time is I think a clear vision uh, and we, we're about ready to incorporate this in our strategic plan has emerged. And that is what I spoke to earlier, that right now it needs to be seamless between what happens in the classroom with the teacher and what that student can do away from the classroom at home. And that we move towards that uh, goal because the whole world is going in that direction of providing more and more. You get your master's, you get your doctorate online, and you need to have the skills to be able to do that. And so I think that's where our vision is going. And, and I think Lance, you'll see that as we finally get finished our uh, strategic plan in that area. Uh, yeah, so, so everybody's speaking the same language, you know, throughout the whole district. I mean, um, because before everybody, it was just like pieces of, a, like I said, a pieces of a puzzle. So I understand what you're saying on the basics of technology, you know, being there, we, we'd use that bond money for, but, you know, I just, I guess I just want to emphasize, I'd like to see 
you know, see what it looks like. And not just now, not just because we're having this pandemic, but what does it look like in the future? You know, what, what can we, like um, Jeff Berry always talks about, Trustee Berry, is just, you know, look, you know, five years down the road where we want to be, right? So I, I'm, I'll be quiet. No, that's good. Where we want to be and what we can afford. <laughs> Those are the two things. So, Mr. Botkin, I would uh, like to offer that you come and meet with the technology department. I think Greg uh, would also like to extend that invitation. And this, this goes for any uh, board member who would like to come and actually sit down and, and talk with us and really see what it is that we're doing and uh, what we're providing to our teachers and our students. I've never had a, a problem with that. I think Jeff has been to visit, Charles has been to visit. Um, love to have you guys back, but um, you know, we, we started the, the part on the LMS, the learning management systems, gosh, eight, nine years ago is when we really started looking into it. And the vision behind it was we were seeing more of the universities and the two-year colleges going to online. And in order to prepare our high school students for that, we needed to have a, a really serious learning management system that mirrored what they were doing in the college level. And then we brought in Turner, which was an early college and career school, it was a natural fit, natural mesh to that. And then as we pushed more and more our high school credits down to the junior highs, that's how we started moving it down in that direction. Um, we never anticipated online remote learning from a pandemic uh, in our wildest dreams, but um, the platform has certainly been in place for, for some time now, and it, it's nice to see how everything is starting to come together. I, I've shared with Dr. Kelly before, it's exciting times for technology. Uh, it, it, it brings a whole different shift of how we look at and what we do, uh, and, and I, I think our department is excited about it, and it's great, you know, working with Dr. Watson and her team. Uh, it's, it, it's really, it, it's been a different, a different look, so all for the good. While we're on technology, can I ask um, just one more question that I've heard Sorry. parents um, concerned about a bunch? Dr. Kelly, I think that if I'm hearing you correctly, that the of the three options that you gave about returning to school, while we're completely uncertain in what option that will be, the if we had to percentage out it, it would be probably a 75% chance that we're returning in a hybrid mode. Yes, uh, and, and the commissioner and the TA officials are basically saying, you know, be prepared for changes uh, closures, temporary closures, and other things that will happen during the school year. So we've got to be prepared for that. I, I, that reminds me of one other thing that I, we discussed and rejected. I've told a little bit about this to Charles. Uh, the commissioner is pushing an idea called intersessional calendars, mm -hmm. which is essentially where you begin in early August and you end in late June and you put in extra times of holidays. For instance, you have two weeks at Thanksgiving, four weeks at Christmas, three weeks at spring break. And the idea is that if school has to be shut down temporarily, then you start carving out instead of Thanksgiving being two weeks, it reverts back to one, et cetera. But as I talked yesterday with the school to work committee, and we have a couple of parents on there who are, uh, one's a physician with a physician's uh, assistant for a wife and the other one's uh, uh, both spouses work. Um, and, uh, uh, there, it, it just, we, we are going to have to have a solution there that works, um, I guess is the easiest way to put that. So have you guys talked about year-round schooling, like moving to a year-round model versus moving to... Yeah, this, uh, the commissioner, uh, this is basically very closely related to year-round schools, but um, it, it only displaces the problem is the unanimous conclusion of the school to work committee was it displaces the problem because instead of kids being off three months in the summer, now you've got daycare needs for them scattered throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So we did not have one person in that entire committee in favor of the intersectional calendar. The closest okay. that I see us coming, and I think that was well representative of how parents in the community would feel. Mm -hmm. So, the only change I see was coming is we stick with our original calendar, but if something happens, 
we could have to extend the school year at the end into June. Now, even that is not under the year round school and under the intersessional calendar ideas. There's still huge problems because AP testing and star testing is not going to change according to the commissioner and according to the country. So after about May 15th, you've got kids sitting in class from May 15th, let's say to late June, where all the testing has already occurred. I can yeah. tell you what teachers would say about that. Right, it's kind of a waste of time and effort. Right, it's very yeah. difficult. And right. so uh, I think the best we can hope for is we build this hybrid model, we're ready to go to it. If a pandemic occurs, hopefully it's allowed for us to do the hybrid type of idea. If absolutely necessary, we do extend the year in June, but we don't try to build two weeks into Thanksgiving, four weeks, a month off at Christmas it, it would give most parents a heart attack. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. So. And I think... school technology model when we re-enter school, that there have been a group of kids that have not had any contact with right. same age peers or with their teachers. Yes, um, some teachers are accessing Zoom or Team or whatever to be able to have some sort of interaction, but there are others in our district that have not accessed that at all. Right. And a large portion that have not had contact oh. with anyone else except their family. Yep. So how do we um, bridge that gap? Well, again, uh, the, the, the ideal bridge is this hybrid, where if, if the kids, for example, are using the very same technology curriculum software, uh, Dr. Watson and her team have put that to, are putting that together. And then when they go home and they're doing their homework or doing all the things that are required of them home, they're already familiar with it because they've been using it in the classroom. And we are in turn better able to hold them accountable because we are seeing them every other day, or in the case of elementary, we're seeing them every half, we're seeing them every day for half a day. So, so I think that's the solution uh, or the best we're gonna be able to do. But you have identified the number one thing that maybe keeps me up at night, which is we cannot continue under the current experimentation where, well, do your work and we sure hope you finish it and, and uh, we're gonna give you credit and the worst that can happen to you is we'll use your prior grade. That cannot survive into the new school year. Right. And I think that um, even if it's some, even if we have to open up in a tech strict technology world, that there's some requirement of our teachers that they have interaction with their students. Yes. And I understand that at the high school level that that is a huge burden for some of those teachers. And it doesn't mean it has to be every day, but I think some, however we're creative about somebody having contact with our students is, is of paramount importance. Well, let me use that as a commercial for an item you're about to uh, discuss and approve, and that is among the uh, personnel positions we're looking for are to, uh, to maintain the previously granted funded truancy positions because Susan Holloway and her outreach office are gonna be big in the coming year if we're gonna accomplish what you just spoke to yeah. uh, about uh, making those contacts. I'm game for that. Uh, the other question, I ha go ahead, Rebecca, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I mean, you, I'll, I'll let you finish, then, I'll, then I can ask mine. Okay, because I... Um, so let me, let me interrupt you just for a Yes, yourself. please. Dr. Kelly, did you have any further outline items that you wanted to hit in your... No, sir, uh, through questions, we okay, hit everything. Great, 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 okay. Mr. Scarbone? So the other piece that um, I've on the other end of the spectrum that parents have reached out with concerns about is that they have immunocompromised children and yes. don't want to see any level of their child being required on yes. campuses and they re, um, are desiring a full entry into online learning through our school district. Yeah. Will parents have the option for that? I Should see that the answer to that is yes. In other words, there's gonna be, we expect, and TA has been telling us that there will be a, a group of parents that um, are fearful about replace, putting their kids back in the system and we'll need to address those. Um, I also read something this morning that uh, homeschooling has become a little bit more of a popular idea mm -hmm. that some people have actually uh, benefited from uh, what they've gone through and are more willing or more desirous of doing that on a longer term basis. Um, now, the difficulty for all that for us is um, 
how will TEA allow us to count attendance funding for kids who are in that kind of a situation? And right now we don't know, but my attitude towards the school to work committee is let's create the ideal and worry about the funding later yeah. um, and then see if we have to make adjustments. Okay, because I've heard from at least four families that are considering unenrolling their students and going to an online technology model if the opportunity in the school district, it, their first choice would be to continue with Pearland ISD and do an online technology route. But alternate to that, if that's not available, that they would unenroll their student. And it presents concerns for me because what does that mean to our enrollment numbers? And then how does that affect our funding? And there's only one tiny silver lining and that is that helps a little bit with social distancing if the numbers are greater. <laughs> but yeah, we, we do not want to see a decrease in our enrollment overall. Okay. Sure. I have tons of other questions, but that's the last yeah. on those topics. So if somebody else wants to jump in, I can go back. Yeah, I okay. just have some, some, I mean, you were talking about the pre-K through four being half day, half morning, half afternoon, and then five through 12 being every other day uh, as an approach. Um, that being said, I mean, in the, in the junior high and high school level, we have, you know, um, you know, AP classes, pre AP classes. How, how are, how is the committee, you, you guys at, as the return to, to school, how are you going to, or are, has there been thoughts on how, how, how are we going to continue to have these types of classes? Um, and then are these, are there, if they're going every other day, are, are the, are the students there all day long? And then um, required then to watch a Zoom, like the, the teacher teaching the next day on Zoom or, I mean, I, I just kind of want to wrap my head around what kind of talk. Uh, well, is the, I know that we'll, we'll, we'll have to take care of the core subjects, you know, in our elementary, but that looks a lot different than in our, in our junior high and, and high school because of the different levels of classes and, and whatnot. At least for me, my thinking and the committee's thinking has not gone deeply into that. There may be others here on the call that can answer some of that better. I would also say that um, a somewhat similar problem is with regard to extracurricular, meaning athletics and fine arts, normally needing to uh, do things both during the day and afterwards. And how do you have a half a football team where half the team shows up on one day and half the team on the next? So. Uh, those are issues that we haven't delved into very much, but I, th I think doc maybe Dr. Watson and some others have begun to process some of that, I don't know. And is there, would you project anything with STAR with the, con have there been any talks about the future of STAR and testing and that sort of thing? Well, um, you know, as, as you probably already know, this year it's everybody's not rated for next year. Um, they're attempting to stick to their guns about everybody being rated and the commissioner's initial statement so far has been that he is not uh, going to change the star testing dates. Uh, so, and it's, you know, that's pretty serious that he says that because he's the one that is in uh, very much in favor of an intersessional calendar that might go into late June. So he knows that and yet he's saying uh, it looks like star testing will not be moved. I have four more questions, <laughs> listen, buddy. shocking, I know. Um, can we talk about graduation for a second? Oh yeah, uh, I, meant to t I meant to talk about that. Um, graduation, uh, as you probably already know, it will be on second, uh, June 2nd, 3rd and 4th at the uh, Pearland ISD Stadium. Second will be Turner, third will be Dawson and, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, June 4th will be PHS. The largest graduation has 746 students in it. Um, the way we're going to do it is we think it's very unique and we think that it's um, the safest thing we can do. Um, and that is we're going to have on the actual field itself um, each graduate and up to four guests all in a little cluster together with seats uh, for the entire group. We will not be using the home stands at all because they're under construction and there's there's some uh, issues with entrance and exit and and with the home side uh, very limited use of the visitor side um, as difficult as this math might seem off the top of our heads um, 
very, even if you add one more person per graduate, you end up needing more stands on the visitor side. So um, the only thing that I, I've received four or five emails this week about, can't you have everybody uh, walk through a line? But all of the guidance that I've been getting from folks is, no, that's not a good idea. It interferes with social distancing. Um, and uh, it right now on a hot June night at 730, we're going to have at least a two hour graduation ceremony as it is. If we go to a line, we're gonna have a three or four hour uh, graduation. So we think at present, this is the best we can do. And what we're thinking, believe it or not, is that after people experience this, they're gonna tell us next year, can we do this in NRG? <laughs> uh, because it's gonna be really cool to have each graduate stand as their name is called with their family right there and then a photographer taking pictures of them and then moving on to the next group. We mm -hmm. still will have the speeches by the Val, Sal, uh, student council president and the principal. And um, although they'll be a little bit abbreviated, we're trying to get out of there in two hours or less. Um, so right now, Crystal, that's what looks like the plan. Okay, yeah, I agree. There's a lot of parents um, and students very upset about the walking piece. Um, and I, I agree to some extent that they can't envision it any different than what it's always been done. And they sort of feel like it's a rite of passage to walk, mm -hmm. whether it's something with a diploma or not. But I, I also agree that being there for four plus hours to get through all of that is really difficult. Um, an extension of that question in the pod, the online documentation that we've, that's been communicated so far says that everybody has to be from the same household. Yes. And my understanding is that that student is probably going back and forth between different households. So it's anyone in direct contact with that student. Yeah. Well, um, we're not gonna police that, but we're gonna basically, our administrators and our families were asking them to use common sense. Right. There's going to be uh, blended families and, and other intricacies, or even at worst, a restraining order against the ex father right. or, or whatever. And we're gonna have to deal with that or be in the middle of it when we have to be. But basically the impetus is on parents, use common sense, right. figure that out, who that's gonna be. We, the oddest thing about this graduation ceremony is that people are gonna look around and say, look at these stands, they're wide open, there's nobody in them. And our answer is because if we start putting people in there, we're going to have serious social distancing problems. And so this is the best we can do. And we're gonna need for you, we also want you to come in one car. We know everybody won't do that. But if everybody drives their own individual car there, we're not gonna have the parking we need uh, and the social distancing we need as they go into the stadium and come back out. Yeah. Um, we are going to have SROs there and faculty and staff to try to, 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 to help people think about that social distancing and to get in and get out the right way, uh, but it, it, it's not going to be perfect and the SROs do not have the legal authority to force someone right. to do certain things. Right. Um, um, and will, there won't be a separate PACE graduation? No, uh, because remember this, this is something folks a lot of times don't realize. Even though there is a separate PACE graduation, those same kids can and for the most part walk during the regular right. one. So they will be included in the regular graduation for their school. Okay, and then I've had questions about life skills students. Um, usually life skills students walk at the beginning so that they're not having to sit in the seat for the entire graduation ceremony. Mm -hmm. What will be the accommodation for life skills families who have needs that pro prohibit them from sitting that entire time? I have not uh, heard that discussion. Uh, somebody, uh, Lisa or um, Nan, want to comment on that? Um, yes, Dr. Kelly. So the principals are actually calling those families. The ones that want to come, they will be seated close. They will be first, as always. They will stand up or be right in the front on that track, so the first row, um, in case they want to leave after that. 
-hmm. but they're also offering to um, let them come to next year's to do across the NRG to do it that way. And I, Kelly Holt mentioned that some of her families are actually choosing that option for the okay. kids. They still get their diploma and certificate, but they're still able to come back and walk. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Also, I, you know, I think I've, um, you all may already realize this, but we're live streaming the event for those who can't be there and we're placing it on large video screens in the, uh, I think we'll, Mr. Berger is planning on two large screens that will, uh, so that people can have a better view than they might uh, from far away. And there'll be enough time between names. It'll be a little bit slower pace than a, a typical graduation in the name calling piece. Um, I don't know enough about that yet. Um, okay. You know, there's a trade-off there. Like we said, we're realizing 7.30 on a June night, we've got to move fairly quickly so that we don't have people sitting in their seats for three hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Good deal. Um, uh, let's see. Anything further? Dr. Kelly? Right away. No, sir. I'm, I'm good. Okay. okay. Board? Staff? Okay. All right. Thank you all very much for the update. All right. We're going to go now back to our regular agenda, item B1. Uh, consider to approve additional personnel. And Dr. Kelly, I was thinking that both of these items are going to affect the budget, so we may discuss them both and then come back and take votes so we can kind of understand the cumulative effect. Yes, sir. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to let uh, uh, David and uh, Sunday weigh in on this one if they'd like to. Yes, go ahead, Sonny. This is yours. I was letting you uh, say something if you wanted to. So um, as far as the additional personnel, um, obviously we went through and listened to the feedback that you guys gave us um, during the workshop. Um, we looked specifically at support counselors. Um, you'll notice there are quite a few positions that have a zero budget impact. Um, the purpose of that is listed um, actually in the rationale, but the, the purpose is twofold. When it comes to the special programs positions, um, we took this opportunity to look at um, an idea that uh, Lisa Nixon brought forward, which was in lieu of using contracted services and spending federal dollars on contracted services, we could get um, more if we switched it over um, and actually hired personnel with her uh, federal dollars. What this allows us to do is, is more hours, more time, more flexibility. Uh, we're not held by the constraints of the, um, of the contractors at that point. So that was a great win for her. And obviously there will still be money that's paid for these positions, but at this point it will be federal dollars. And Lisa was actually able to send me a document earlier today and um, those federal dollars are there, we've checked. Um, so we know it's, it's gonna be a good situation for her. With regards to the, uh, three of the teaching positions referenced in the document, as well as six of the classroom aid positions, when we have listed for growth, that simply means if enrollment is there and the kids show up, then we're able to fund the positions. But what you guys are approving are allowing us to create the FTEs with zero money behind it, so that it, in the event kids do show up or classrooms do become very full, we can act quickly and we don't have to wait for an upcoming board meeting to get approval for an FTE that, um, that may need to exist. Um, the, I'm going to save the, uh, the case managers for last because I know that that's going to be something that you guys are interested in and Susan Holloway is actually present in the meeting if we need to speak to those. Um, the custodial supervisor and the three custodians, those are not only for square footage but more so for um, well, the custodial supervisor specifically is more so because we only have one of those positions. Um, in the evenings, she drives to all 23 locations and uh, oversees all of our custodians. And I'll be perfectly honest, she's probably very tired by the time she gets home. So um, with two custodial supervisors in the evenings, that will allow um, Matt Klein and his staff to divide up 
uh, different sides of Pearland and kind of balance out creating more oversight, more time for training when cleaning is such an important thing that we're about to be doing, providing more supervision in the evenings when cleaning is gonna be at its most important time is gonna be really important. And then obviously three custodians um, with, with more square footage and, and things of that nature, um, you need more custodians, there's just no way around it. Um, the seven and one half classroom aids, you'll notice originally we had asked for only three aids. Um, when we ran some numbers and looked at the enrollment as of now, we were able to see that we needed three special programs aids. Um, we repurposed a, a PE teaching position from Carlston and we're going to add a PE aid in its place because Carlston's overall enrollment is going down. Therefore, they don't need two teachers. They can function with one teacher and one aide in their physical education world. Um, and then three and a half pre-kindergarten positions for our bilingual campuses. The reason it's three and a half is one of our campuses already has a 0.5 pre-K uh, aid. And so this will allow us to ensure that all of those bilingual campuses have a pre-K aid. Um, like I said, I was holding the, um, I was holding the case managers for the last portion of this. Uh, Dr. Kelly mentioned them before. Um, we had a grant for the last several years and these positions were in essence placed at the high schools. Uh, Pearland High School had one full time that I believe also assisted at Pace and then Turner and Dawson um, had one as well. And what these case managers did and Susan Holloway, please correct me if I'm wrong, is they helped reach out specifically to the kids that were having absentee issues, create contracts to get them in the door more frequently, follow up with them, um, kind of be that, that bridge between, I'm gonna be in a truancy situation versus I'm just really increasing my absences. And um, this was an extra set of hands for the campuses to really lean on. I think I hit every position, if not, ask away. We'll open up the floor for questions then. Uh, Charles, do you want to, um, I could have George Annie sort of weigh in on the financial implications. Sure, sure. Or, George Annie, you ready to talk about how that fits into the budget or what will be required? Sure, well, those positions, I already uh, accounted for them in, in the budget. Uh, of course, they were not there during the budget workshop number one, um, but as a result of the higher, um, percent increase in the property taxes, we we're able to uh, absorb those and still end up with a, a balanced budget as of now. So every day, of course, it's, um, I get um, new estimates and, and whatnot, but so far I'm, I'm able to absorb them and still present the balanced budget along with the proposed raises that, that are in the next agenda item. As far as those zero, uh, zero funded positions, do we have to come back and approve a salary for those positions? If, if, so the good thing is that if, if the students come in and we need to hire, they don't need to wait on the hiring process on starting right. the whole application, the two week period and all that. We would have to come back and uh, if, if I can't find the budget through savings, I would have to come back to you and amend the budget. Okay, okay, great. Uh, Dr. Dalkamp, I wanted to ask about that, um, the uh, PE teacher over at Carlston. And uh, a few years ago when that enrollment was going up, uh, we moved from uh, one person with a teaching certificate to and a teacher's assistant. And we had to switch that person out to bring in two teachers because the numbers were going up. Uh, my concern is that, like, I get that that's a budget, uh, things that needs to be moved around to have some positions elsewhere. But it kind of takes those teachers uh, that out of that um, out of that relationship with those kids. And I'm speaking uh, personally because you know, full disclosure, I'm a cross parent, right? So we had to deal with that when uh, you know back a few years ago, and so now it's going to be it's going to it's going to happen again, right? So I'm, I'm I'm assuming that the two people that are there and that um, in those positions, one of them is going away, right? And we're bringing another person in. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, 
I guess and you've been she, in contact with the with the campus about that, the principal, they all understand what's going on? Okay. Yeah, the other PE teacher that was the one that um, the one that's no longer going to be at Carlston, she was actually given the opportunity to stay at Carlston okay. as a classroom teacher, and she okay. chose not to. She chose okay. to go to another campus and remain a PE teacher instead. Perfect. Okay, I understood. All right, thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Any, let's see, uh, from the board, any other questions on those? Uh, so. Okay, and, and Mrs. Carter, you mentioned that everything we're looking at here is absorbed by our budget, so we're still balanced. Oh, so right now, yes. Okay, all right. So with that in mind, uh, members, uh, is, is there any objection to go ahead and voting on this, or would you rather hear the second item prior to uh, voting on this? I make a motion. Okay. Uh, that the board of trustees approve the recommendation of additional positions for the 2020-2021 school year and subsequent years. Second. All right, motion, Decker, second, Botkin. Any further discussion? All right, hearing none, we will vote. Uh, Trustee Barry. All right, Trustee Murphy. Aye. All right, Trustee Botkin. Aye. Gooden votes aye. Trustee Decker? Aye. Trustee Carbone? Aye. All right, one more time for uh, Trustee Barry. Are you still with us, sir? Okay. The record will show that that uh, vote passed. The motion carries 5-0 with Trustees Floyd and Barry absent. All right, we'll go to item uh, B2 there. Yes. And, um, yes, sir. Go ahead, Dr. President. Um, I know you're already familiar with this uh, recommendation from our workshop, um, but um, there may be little nuances that uh, we should concentrate on. There is one, um, you know, the, if you remember, uh, we obviously uh, promoted the idea of a 4% salary increase. Uh, also, the board came back to us and said, you know, we'd really like to see the equity adjustments made in there, and you'll see a figure for those on page 66. Uh, also, um, as Mr. Moody and others have projected an increase in the district's annual contribution towards employee health insurance of $300. Now, I, I should give David a chance to explain further here because we also wonder if the board would like to go an additional $25 per month, which would be an additional $300 beyond that. Um, so let me leave that, my comments there, and uh, David, if you'd uh, take it from there. Sure. Uh, just to back up real quick to the, the workshop, uh, not a whole lot's changed here um, from what we talked about in the workshop. So the first thing I want to do is just say um, thank you to uh, George and Annie. We worked together on this. Both, uh, both departments worked on this. And um, she put us in a good spot last year um, when we were conservative coming out on the first year. Many of the districts around us, we talked about that, were not as conservative. Um, and so the average raise, uh, I think last year, on the 18 districts that I tend to look at that surround us was about uh, almost 6% compared to our 2.5 on half of our employees and 3% 3, 3 for teachers. So um, that gave us strong footing this year. Um, for the first time in a long time, I feel like we, we have a really good budget walking into this decision for you guys. Um, and it gives us a chance to make up some ground because as Dr. Kelly has mentioned a couple of times, uh, the word on the street right now is most of the districts around us are going to be hard pressed to give this type of raise. So we're going to be, uh, I think, in the winning spot this year. Um, and, and I'm hoping that that is the case because some of that ground that I, I refer to making up within the teachers at the 10, 15, 20 year benchmarks with a 4% raise with, you know, some of our neighboring districts that I reached out to last week, one, one that's pretty competitive with us was talking about a 1% raise that 3% difference right there already changes and, and, and allows us to play some catch up on those benchmark years. On top of that, uh, George Annie has uh, worked to build in equity adjustments for um, about 700 to 800 teachers. Uh, that range is, you know, that has a range to it on what that equity adjustment looks like, but some of our teachers will reach potentially if you adopt this uh, item up to 5%. Moving down, uh, another really important item is you'll notice the starting pay at 58.1. Uh, that's always a big thing for us in the district. Um, 
when you look at as many teachers as we hire, uh, new teachers, uh, and, and Sunday you can weigh in here, but I think it's usually about 40 to 50 new teachers. Uh, I don't think we'll hire that many this year because we're already at 5% turnover rate uh, right now. But so that expense, that $2,000 times 40 teachers, you're talking about $80,000 investment to put a $58,000 number out there for, for, for the competition piece. And then our job is always, I think most of your principals will tell you, once we get the, once we get the teachers into the building, um, our job in retaining them is to make sure they have a great environment in their school with their principals, with their colleagues, and so forth. And we do a pretty good job of that too. Um, another uh, important piece to, to pull out there is that control point that George Andy put in place at 62.5 is where we build our raise off of. So that's an increase that adds to uh, the raise component. And finally, uh, what I would say there is the, uh, the last workshop we had, I felt like we, we had a, in my mind, a pretty good consensus, but I didn't want to push that forward. We had talked about um, in the past couple years that the board would take a step-by-step -step approach to add to contribution 25, 25, and 25. Um, as, as we were talking in the workshop, I was picking up from you guys that you wanted to be more aggressive with that. So we didn't put that in place unless you want to go there uh, tonight or today. Um, but it, it would be uh, in line with what we put in our strategic plan too, that we, we truly wanted to be more aggressive. We felt like we needed to be more aggressive for benefits. Uh, just didn't know if the money would be there. So um, that's the decision for you guys to make there. Right now it's 275, which is a $50 uh, increase over the past two years. So 25 and 25, unless you can uh, find a way to get to uh, 50 this year. That's, that's pretty much what I had. Any questions? Yes, Georgiani, what is the implicate the amount if we like, oh it's four I guess it's four hundred and five thousand dollars if we go to the three hundred thousand I mean uh, the three three hundred as opposed to two seventy five yes and a, an additional four hundred and five because I already have the first twenty five dollars built in the budget so this would take us out of the balanced budget basically by four so now we're we're at a deficit of four thousand. I mean, 405,000. I will say um, getting offline, just to you know, to add a little bit more to this. Um, I looked at, I think there was a survey going out from our, the HR departments around the, around the area. And I do feel like we need to get to the $300 contribution. Um, I, would, I would hope that we could get there. It, it just comes down to the decision of the board. I feel like it's a, it's marketable, it's more competitive, it's where we need to be. And then when we get there, um, in the following years, we need to continue looking at how to enhance our, our benefits package. And on top of the fact, going back to the benchmark years, closing that gap up, we're not gonna completely close that gap. Um, that was never our intention, that would require a lot of money. George and I were talking about this morning, that very much how we, we've taken kind of a step approach to uh, improve our benefits, it might be something that we take a step approach to continuing uh, outside of the general pay increase, but every year to come back with something, even if it's a small portion, to continue closing the gap for those, uh, some of those veteran teachers. Okay, Mr. Woody, on those uh, equity adjustments, uh, the comment I made was um, I wanted to be more aggressive yeah, and, um, and and so am I understanding it correctly that you're saying that we were more aggressive with what was offered to teachers and we included more teachers in that? Uh, uh, actually, we were more aggressive in other areas. And that's kind of what I heard you say is that right. we wanted us to look in other areas. And so when you look at the total package of the equity adjustments, I think we we almost doubled it. We went mm -hmm. into looking at other areas, uh, other job families. Uh, the business department, some of our lower paid employees, um, some of our directors. We looked at some of our directors and the career path there from a principalship to promote into a director was not where we needed it to be. So that's part of it. Okay. So there's some other areas. Um, but to answer your question, going back to the teachers, no, we would need to be much more aggressive. Uh, and that would, that would, that would require a lot of money. And I would say this, that, um, you know, when we're, when we're sitting and we're talking about this comp plan, this package that we as a team put together with Dr. Kelly supporting that, 
we feel good about it. We feel good that it's competitive. It's more than competitive out there. Um, but you also, we're also pressed with just like you guys are looking at what is, what does next year look like and how far can we go and do when we have a balanced budget, how far do we want to push past that? And, um, so that kind of stops you a little bit, Mr. Gooden, from getting, you know, highly competitive or highly aggressive on and laying more money out there on those teacher benchmark years. But I think that, um, we don't have to eat that all this year. I think that if we do what we're doing with benefits right now, keeping an eye on it, that we can bring something back again next year to you guys and keep chipping away at it. Okay. And so the 400,000 at this point is gonna come from fund balance, question mark? Not, not the 400,000 to bring the benefits up $25 a month. So where are we, I mean, if we're no longer in a balanced budget, where, no, where are those funds coming That from? is if we approve a $50 increase, uh, monthly increase. The $25 monthly increase is already factored uh, in the budget. Okay, so as presented today, everything is covered and we're in a balanced budget. Yes. Sir. What's being suggested at this point is adding an additional $25 to what's being presented here putting us at a deficit of 405,000. 405, yes. Okay. Yeah. Crystal, um, you remember in that last workshop, I felt like listening to you guys, it sounded like you wanted to do more. We haven't put that in here. We wanted to give the board the opportunity if that's the decision you made. Um, I would say that it, it, it would be good money to spend. I understand. I don't know that I disagree with you, especially in this time where teachers are being asked to do more and more that's far beyond the scope of what a typical role has been for them. Um, they deserve all the accolades and rewards that we can afford to give them, in my opinion. So, agree. So, just talking about opportunity costs, what if we took that 405000 and appropriated it somewhere else in the budget? Right, that that dealt with compensation, but that would touch everybody. Now, granted, four hundred five thousand dollars doesn't go super far um, with um, with um, when you're talking about the number of people we're talking about. But just was there any thought given to to, to that? Like, um, Are you talking about? Remember again, just remember the the four hundred five that's on this for you to accept right now is twenty five dollars, and so right. uh, we're we're in line with where we we've talked about even into last year. The right. additional the additional uh, forty or fifty that or twenty five that I would be recommending. Um, I think I think we need to go there. I think we, you know I would love for us to be aggressive. We put it in the strategic plan to go there. Right. Uh, comes down to what can we what can we spend yeah you know Charles my only uh, other way of looking at that uh, would be that and, and I, I try not to make this uh, widely known because it's it's subject to the realities at, at the mid-year point but that we of course could do what we have done in a couple of years in the past and that is um, uh, add some amount a one-time pay uh, in December or so uh, provided that the finances of the district would allow it at that time. And, and thank you for saying that because that's the that's the opportunity cost I'm thinking about and yeah. so that but that one-time payment is not included in the budget that we've seen correct? That's correct that's correct sir. All right so and what would that look like what was it what would that one-time payment How, what, what would that look like? Uh, my memory is not good on this. Uh, Georgiani, do you remember the, the amount? Last, the last time that we had one was in the 17-18 fiscal year. Um, and I believe it was $400 for professionals and $300 for paraprofessionals. It was a mid-year adjustment that happened in December. We had to, it was subject to um, the unassigned fund balance projected right. to be over Right. 90 days 90 at, at that particular point in time. Um, I, I'm not sure if that decision would have to be made right now or if it could be made when we actually present the budget because we've just had the conversation about all the technology that we're going to need that is not in the budget. 
And that's going to come out of fund balance as well. And so when you're talking about, okay, is your unassigned fund balance going to be, you know, 90 days, uh, I, I got to go into it, right? Um, right. So there's, a, a, I guess, a larger conversation as far as that is concerned, that if we're able to make that decision, uh, we can make it a little bit more informed at the June board meeting. Okay. And so what's that number look like for a, uh, a supplemental payment? The last um, yeah. You bring up a really good point about the looking at the supplemental payment, looking at another $25, uh, and then looking at um, the technology piece uh, that we're going to be looking at funding. Uh, just just kind of wanting to understand what my cumulative impact is, is going to be. And do I, I get more utility, Mr. Moody, out of uh, the, the supplemental payment or the... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Other, I, other, I, I, I knew where you were going to. I, yeah. you know, I was wanting Dr. Kelly to pick that one up. So yeah. um, just the idea of down the road, would we have the opportunity if we wanted to, to do a one-time payment? And would this money be better served to give to 100% of our employee base? Mm -hmm. I get it and I understand it. Um, if I was to combat that, I would say that, um, again, from a competitive point of view, where we want to go with our benefits is still more aggressive than where we're going to land today at this mm -hmm. spot. And we can keep, you know, the plan all along was to do 25, 25, and 25. So I would come back to you next year to get us to 300. Right. Uh, we don't have to change that plan. We can, we can adopt this tonight. Uh, we can bring back um, the, the comparison of that $25 if we were to add more to the benefits in June. Uh, and compared to uh, what is the total cost of that supplemental one-time payment if we chose to do it. Right. Okay. And so I guess what we, where we are now is I got, I'm not opposed to increasing the benefit to uh, the health insurance. Um, but for, I guess, for future decisions, you know, let's see what that one-time supplemental payment looks like. What kind of fund balance uh, criteria do we uh, put on it? And then what are we looking at as far as uh, going to a one-to-one -one device uh, type deal? And uh, I guess as far as one-to-one -one devices, we're not the kind of organization that can just go out and finance something. Um, so I, I guess we're, we're in a situation for those devices, we're gonna be talking about you know, paying cash for those. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, okay. And, yeah. and on top of that, we're gonna be talking about um, committing fund balance every single year for for the time when those devices come to their the end right. of their useful life we're going to have to replace them right 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 and well, that's all part of that should all be part of the capital improvement program anyway so i mean that should just be a slide into that but i guess the question i have uh mr moody is on that four hundred and five thousand for the additional 25 dollars on the benefits how many people is that based on how many people? How many people are involved? Uh, we have about. I mean, are you just are you you just using, are you just taking twenty five dollars and multiplying it times every employee? Yeah. Or just the number of employees that are currently enrolled or. Uh, Georgie, how, how did you? How did you? Yeah, that's a good question. How did you budget? It, right now, we it, have about sixty percent. Right. It is the number of employees that are currently enrolled. So to be fair, that number could slot up a uptick. The 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 stronger okay. our package gets, we could get more people that were more interested in it. But right now, since I've been in this department, it, it hovers around 58 to 62% on, uh, on enrollment. It could right. go up or it could go down as well. If, uh, you know, um, my spouse has a better insurance plan, all of a sudden I'm going to drop out, you know, and go to my right. spouse. And so it, it kind of, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a, of a balancing act. I mean, this is this is where I am on on this whole the whole benefit thing, and we spend a lot of time trying to what I what I consider keep up with the Joneses on salaries, and I think we finally did that uh, this year. Um, I think we're in a good place there, but we can't always make it about base salaries and average salaries and things of that sort. We have to have some other some other mechanism to attract and retain good employees. Um, and benefits are one of those, even though we have, you know, roughly 50 to 60 percent of our employee base that utilize those benefits, uh, we still have to have another uh, carrot, so to speak, to, to be able to get them to stay with us for a long period of time. 
And so, uh, you know, as far as the benefits go, uh, we definitely need to start considering uh, strengthening that program in any possible way that we can. Um, we're just continuing to fall. It seems like we are anyway. We're continuing to fall behind on, on, on the benefits, of, you know, as compared to our neighbors. And, um, and looking through the list of, you know, um, resignations earlier, I mean, we're losing people to all of our, dis all of our neighboring campus uh, districts, right? So I didn't see anyone that were too terribly lopsided, which tells me that we, we just really don't have that one inkling of, of reason for them to really stay unless, unless we have a strong benefit program and a strong uh, uh, payment program, so strong salary base. So um, I'm all for, you know, going to 275 on the benefits or even 300. I'm all for that. Uh, maybe too much of a step this year, given the situation with the IT that we're, we're currently finding ourselves in. So um, I don't know. I just uh, don't know how to handle the IT issue. I think we're going to have to kind of work that in somehow, too. So um, it's a well, huge the, hurdle to overcome. Uh, on the, back on the benefits real quick, a, a great message from the board to you in terms of, I know you guys have your ear out there to our employee base and benefits has been um, a pretty big issue. I know that you've heard it. We've heard it. Um, if we can stretch and we can find a way to get to that 300 mark, which would be adding another 25 on top of what you see on the paper, um, you would have been committing over the last two years uh, right around a million to, uh, to support uh, our benefits package, which is a, is a pretty significant jump and something that we could celebrate. Um, so um, I I'm all for going to the 300. Um, Anything we do with the benefits package is great. So um, I'm gonna make a motion here in a second. But um, as far as everything else goes, you know, you know, we have a fund balance for a reason, right? Um, I know we don't. We just need to go spend it as fast as we have it. But we also need to think about that's why we have a fund balance during times like this. But we need fund balance, and it is kind of not just a rainy day, it's a rainy storm that keeps popping on top of us. So um, you know, keep that in mind that that's where that money's there. With that being said, I'd like to make a motion that the board approves the salary benefits compensation package with an added uh, $25 uh, to the benefits package presented for the 2020-21 school year. All right, motion back in. Uh, Dr. Kelly, uh, Mr. Moody, does that motion get you where you need to be as far as? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we understand it, what, what he's saying there. He's basically saying what we've recommended plus the additional uh, $25 per month for health insurance. Perfect, perfect. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, second uh, to Barry. Any further discussion? Murphy has something to say. He has his hand up. I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Murphy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'd, I would have liked to have seen, I, I don't know if we just didn't, get this or it was you know not provided this year but we didn't see a a deal that moody normally provides showing us the comparisons of what other districts did kind of a survey of what other districts surrounding us were doing are you talking in terms of actual salary i'm talking about in percent of raises you know what ccisd what alvin did yeah i will tell you right now sean we're, we're going to probably be the first out of the gate i have not heard of okay. any district that's uh, that's um actually gone out and approved a raise we are literally to my knowledge going to be one of the first ones out there yeah sean i would add to that that is exactly what i'm hearing from superintendents all over region four but uh we are going to gain ground because they're talking one to two percent for the most part so we will gain ground if we if we uh, pass what we're recommending here. Yeah, I also know that Al Alvin ISD is trying to build up uh, their fund balance, and so they're they're watching every everything they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean I've got some concerns about what that price tag on the uh, the one to one devices is going to look like, and uh, when we talk about bringing that. You know, the fund balance, I look at it as, I mean, we use that fund balance throughout the year. 
right, to kind of supplement liquidity between uh, the payments that we get from the, from the state. Um, and so it's not just sitting there all year. And, you know, as we use it, chances of replenishing it, not very much. So I'm all for all of this. It's just that I'm, I'm um, you know, we got some issues going on with what our tax valuations are going to look like. They're going to be really high. They're going to be, there's going to be some, um, some pushback uh, on our valuations. Like uh, Mrs. Carter said, we're probably going to see a little bit of a reduction. I am just, um, I want to do all of this, but, uh, you know, whatever, I start kind of just start pulling back. Y'all know how I am. I'm like, well, you know, exactly what is this total price tag going to look like? But um, I understand exactly what uh, administration is trying to do. I understand the focus and the goal and the reason behind all of this. And don't get me wrong, I 100% agree with it, right? It's just that now I'm looking at a total price tag that I can't quite see right now, uh, but we're just going to have to make some tougher decisions later. later so. just, hey, hey, Charles, real yeah. quick. Yeah. Yeah. I just, if, if we spend $500 per unit on per per student, then that's $11 million. Mm -hmm. And so ah, okay. I don't even know what, what we're looking at or anything. I just guessed uh, yeah. it may or may not even be that much. I have no idea, but you know, it, this kind of goes back to the whole idea of the capital improvement plan that I talk about constantly. You know, if we have, if we have a plan, we have a mechanism to be able to support in, injections like this, maybe not something as large as this, but you know, we have plans to be able to, number one, the one concern I heard is, not only do we have to spend the money now, but we have to spend the money on how to figure out how to refresh these devices in the next four years, because that's generally the life cycle of those types of devi effective life cycle of those devices. I know we get a lot more use of utilization out of, out of some of them, but you know, that's there again, taking an active effort by the IT department to understand, because this isn't an anomaly, by the way, we had a 100% refresh of all of, our, all of our servers and technology throughout the campus, uh, throughout all campuses this year. So that's what the $20 million was for. Now all of a sudden we have another chunk of IT equipment that has a shorter lifespan associated with it. Still, no definitive plan on how we're gonna manage our IT resources over a long period of time. We're gonna keep getting the, and it's just a matter of time before we have another large grouping of HVACs that need to be done, roofs that need to be done. You guys, have, we've all seen the list. So how are we going to manage and or stagger these, these large costs associated with just basic uh, maintenance of, of our infrastructure and our IT equipment? You know, I hate to continue to beat a dead horse here, but, you know, if we had that plan, a legitimate plan, not just a list, in place, we would have at least a mindset throughout the district of how to integrate this large expense all at one time. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, well, to be, I guess, fair on this, on the one-to-one -one device thing, this is brand new, right? So as far as we're talking about, you know, chillers and maintenance and roofs and all that kind of stuff, I understand, you know, I guess there's a, there's a time frame outward that, you know, beyond that, we don't have a vision. I mean, not a vision, but we don't have those numbers associated. But I get what we're trying to do with some of the capital assets, right, the real estate assets. It's just that I'm saying that this is, you know, the one-to-one -one device is just a brand new thing, right? And so I, I don't know if we're going to be able to get laptops for 500 bucks. Um, I doubt it. <laughs> and so I was just um, picking a number. Yeah, I, just, I mean, I know, but I, I mean that 500 bucks sounds great, but I mean I don't I don't yeah. know. But, I mean, it made to it made to Craig too. Yeah, you <laughs> know, we're looking at somewhere between 11 to 22 million. It's just using that much cash. But at any rate, okay. There's a no, uh, uh, Charles. One last yeah. comment on there that doesn't help my own case, but I'm not as much worried about the outlay for the initial machines or even the refresh four years down the road because I think of that as as the price of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. But what I do worry about is the support cost, either in terms of personnel or uh, contracted services to service all those units. That 
is a recurring cost every year. And so before we get to the June board meeting, we're going to have to really analyze what we think is realistic to present to y'all on that. I mean, in my opinion, it may not even be doable. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, we definitely got so it. You're saying the one-on-one -on -one -on -one is not doable, Jeff? No, I'm just, I'm just, um, maybe it's just be thinking out loud, but I mean, it may not be necessarily doable um, in the way that we want to do it right now in this short of period of time. Well, I, or I agree with you on that. I also think that our hand might be forced to, I mean, there may not be an option. True. You know, with the, I mean, depending on this pandemic and what we're having to do, because we have to be able to reach all of our students. So, right. I mean, this, you know, I, it's, I unfor that. it's a, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that we're in this predicament, you know, but again, um, it's also fortunate that we up. have a, we have a fund balance that we, that we can service our students on this, but you're right with having to have a plan because in four years, we're going to have to, we're going to have to refurbish and, and renew and do all that kind of stuff. So I agree with, hey, with your, your assessment. One, on that. Another quick question for George Annie is, um, you know, we do these, we, we do have these inflections throughout the year, like Charles was mentioning, um, when we have to make payments or we have to use fund balance to, you know, to stave off, um, uh, tax payments and such. What is that ag What is that average flow over the year? So, like, doesn't that have? I mean, can't you can't you interpolate what that number would be? Because I know that payment comes up in August, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. After August, what do you anticipate that number being? Maybe. What do you mean the the TAC fund payment or what the fund talking? balance after no, after balance, make uh, payment. It, it dips low. Uh, of course, right now we have a large fund balance and I'm projecting to end the year with a 3 million surplus. Um, yeah. so it's gonna grow a little bit more, right? Um, we have about a 33% fund balance. We need at least um, two months of operations um, for when that, um, for when our revenues um, dip low, right? We're not getting tax payments. We're not getting um, state payments. Um, I don't have the number right off the top of my head. Um, I need to dig in, in my documents, but um, I would say maybe about 15 million. Five zero or one five? Let, let me look at it. I don't, have, I don't have it right here. I don't wanna say the wrong thing. No, 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 I understand. I, was just... I really don't want to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so, Jeff, that, that was uh, your question. So, we, we do have a motion in a second on the yes. floor. Um, yes, ma'am. President Gooden, I, after hearing all of this discussion and kind of taking a step back, I mean, I definitely want to reward our teachers for everything and all the efforts that they're given. And um, I don't see, I, I see them taking these raises and the pieces that we're doing and we're offering in the current proposal um, and being excited about that. And so I don't see $25 holding them back or not retaining them over the long term. And I think that if we're being prudent, we can take a step back and re look at this at a different time. And it's $25, you know, I mean, it's, it's a half million dollars in the grand scheme of things, but it can be allocated differently after we have a full picture of everything that's coming at us. So yeah. I don't know. I, I hear what you're saying and I don't disagree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. Uh, but again, the, uh, the motion in a second is on the floor. Uh, and, um, Without any other further, without any further discussion, uh, then we'll we'll go ahead and uh, take a vote. <laughs> okay. All right. So we are voting on. Uh, I'm going to Trustee Bakken, Would you restate your motion? Yes, sir. Uh, let's see. Uh, I make a motion that the board approves the salary benefit compensation package, including the twenty-five dollar addition. 
to the benefits package presented for the 2020-2021 school year. All right, that is the motion and the second was uh, from Mr. Berry. So with no further discussion, well, not hearing any further discussion, is there any? All right, we will vote. Uh, Trustee Bakken, you lead it off. How do you vote, sir? Yes, yeah, aye. <laughs> Good and votes, aye. Decker? Decker? Aye, I was muted, sorry. Okay, Carbone? Aye. Barry? Aye. Murphy? 100% aye, thanks Mr. Moody. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six in favor, zero against with Mr. Floyd uh, absent. The motion carries. All right, thank you all very much and uh, thank you all for indulging that conversation. Um, so yeah, so as going forward, we, we still do want to see uh, obviously what that looks like for the one-to-one -one devices and second, what it looks like for a uh, one-time supplemental payment uh, for, the, uh, for staff. Okay, uh, items C, D, and E. Dr. Kelly, did you want to touch on any of those? The bond financial update, the report on the financial statement, and the quarterly investment report. Is that all there? Uh, just one comment, Charles. Okay. Um, as uh, Georgiani uh, pointed out a few minutes ago, um, the financial statement report that you have in there is, is, is as of March 31st, 2020, was still projecting a deficit, but as she is uh, uh, finishing up the, the fiscal year, it looks better. We'll actually uh, end with a surplus. And that's kind of remarkable if you remember where we started last year with budget uh, preparation. Uh, so that is a piece of good news. Right, okay. All right. Okay, that was on there. All right. All the rest of that is for your uh, consumption, trustees. Uh, Dr. Kelly, I show that we have completed the agenda. Do you see anything I missed? No, sir. We're good. All right. All right. All right. With no further business to come before the board, we will stand adjourned at 3.03 p.m. Thank you all very much.